and he is going to talk with us uh, about his area of expertise, which is diabetes, and his talk is entitled Comorbidities in the CAD Patient, What's New in the Management of Diabetes, Acute and Chronic Management. Welcome, Darren. Okay, good afternoon. Thanks for having me here, Kristen. It's always great to get back to North Carolina, um, my second home, um, for sure. Maybe uh, a, a new home in the future. We'll see if that ever plays out. But um, it's great to be here. Mike's complaining about it being 100 in Durham today. I think it was 100 in Dallas at 4.30 this morning when I left. So I don't have a lot of sympathy there. So I came to Duke in uh, 1997 to learn how to do clinical trials and specifically with an interest in diabetes at, from a cardiovascular perspective. And I like to say I was country when country wasn't cool. Um, very few people in cardiology were interested in diabetes at the time. And we certainly didn't anticipate this explosion, both of the epidemic of diabetes and the cardiovascular concerns that have come with it. And so um, it's better to be lucky than good. And I think I was lucky to get the training I got at a time when we were really beginning to drill down into some of the cardiovascular issues with diabetes. So we'll just talk today about two general topics. Um, um, first, to frame the, con the, the, the constructs here is why would a cardiologist be interested in diabetes even in 19... 97 and still interested in why should general practitioners maintain their interest with a special cardiovascular focus on diabetes, which many of us did not train um, to deal with uh, when we went through our basic training. So we know that obesity is prevalent um, across the United States. Texas is here um, hovering just below the 30% threshold, as is North Carolina in these data from 2008. Both North Carolina and Texas were 29 plus percent obese in 2008. So we have this huge uh, obesity epidemic. Part of it is uh, we can uh, attribute to North Carolina, right down the road um, in Greensboro. Hardy's hamburger chain was established about 40 years ago and apparently was on some financial rough times. And they launched this monster thick burger series of sandwiches back in the mid-90s. And this resuscitated financial viability of Hardy's. This single sandwich has 1,340, 1,360 calories. This is without the Coca-Cola and the big size fries. And it has almost 100 grams of fat just in the sandwich. And so we're living in a very toxic environment. We're living in an environment that's so toxic that we've, it gets better. Um, we've uh, engineered physical activity completely out of our lives. Um, we can go up one flight of stairs of escalators. This photograph is taken at the American Diabetes Association meeting. <laughs> and so here are all the diabetology experts lined up to go up one step. And here are the two Europeans rushing out to smoke um, <laughs> the cigarettes. So... Again, the toxic environment is all around us, and we have to um, be prepared to intervene as clinicians. And so the best way to treat diabetes is to prevent it. And so we can do very simple measures. We can be creative engineering-wise. We can put pedometers on belts and ask patients to count their steps and simply give them targets. And as I heard earlier, I think John was talking about have them wear their track suit for 15 minutes before they actually start moving. You know, baby steps. If you put these pedometers on obese type 2 diabetic patients, you will commonly see 800 or 900 steps a day. Now, that's one-tenth of the health prescription of 10,000 steps a day. So these patients just are simply not moving. And if they can move from 800 to 1,500, that's a, that's a step in the right direction, no pun intended. Our kids are getting type 2 diabetes more commonly now than type 1 diabetes. This is a joystick connected to a video game, and so they're having to jump around to play their video game, a little exercise in the, in the video arcade. This one's my favorite. I think Kristen, probably anybody who's ever seen me give talks, is my favorite little device. This is called the TV pedalometer. And it has an electrical cord that goes to the television, and it generates household current electricity with no capacitor. So the moment you get below the target workload, the TV goes off. And so you have to, <laughs> you have to pedal, pedal to maintain the workload. Okay, so we can prevent diabetes, and we can do it with lifestyle interventions, but we're not very effective at doing it, and we're being flooded in every clinical setting with these patients with diabetes. And these are uh, population prevalence estimates in 2008. Again, Texas is hovering just below the 12% threshold here, and several states have now exceeded 10% uh, population prevalence, more than one out of 10 adults unselected in the United States with type 2 diabetes. So this is a huge public health problem, and with diabetes comes cardiovascular risk. Now, as I trained, we learned about microvascular disease risk. We learned about glucose control, and we learned that glucose control affected microvascular disease risk. It was the underpinning and the focus of all the diabetes management as I went through internal medicine training. Um, but we quickly have realized over the last decade, I say quickly, it's taken us almost a decade to, decade to fully appreciate the cardiovascular consequences of diabetes. And so these are data from the UK PDS, one of the largest randomized trials in diabetes. About 4,000 patients newly diagnosed type 2 diabetes were randomized to a number of different glucose control strategies. 
Now, if you shuffle all these patients together independent of their treatment assignment and just simply looked at what happened to everybody in the study using it as an epidemiologic database, you see that if you look at blindness, 3.5%. This was defined by two or more drops on a visual scale, so not frank blindness all the time. End-stage renal disease was 0.6%. This is 40,000 patient years of data, 0.6%. So relatively uncommon. Serious when it happens, but relatively uncommon. If you add all these together, the microvascular disease risk is less than 10%. Contrast that with coronary heart disease alone, over 20%. If you add stroke and revascularization, it's well over one in four patients. So a three to four-fold increased likelihood of having atherosclerotic events compared with microvascular disease events. So this begs our attention and begs our attention to expand beyond glucose, not to forget about the glucose, but to expand beyond it. So I usually pause here and launch into the evidence-based medical arsenal for blood pressure control and lipid management and antiplatelet therapy, but we're going to talk today about glucose. I don't always talk about glucose despite my interest in diabetes, but finally in uh, 2010, we actually have some data we can look at. So let's look at what's happened to patients with diabetes who have heart attacks. So patients who have diabetes in the blue versus overall study cohorts in the red, um, over time, so this is pre-ICU in the 1960s through the 1980s, 2000, and presently, everybody's improved their outcomes with myocardial infarction, whether you have diabetes or not, but the gradient of risk has persisted. That is, diabetes pretends a two- to three-fold increased likelihood of most adverse events, even in contemporary management of uh, myocardial infarction. Well, that's what we've seen up to now. We've actually just uh, finishing analyses of over uh, 1.7 million consecutive patients in the United States in the National Registry of Myocardial Infarction. And what we see from 1994 to 2006, this is hospital mortality with non-diabetic patients in the yellow and diabetic patients in the red. And sure enough, in 1994, there was a large increment of risk. But importantly, what you see here is we are finally beginning to narrow the gradient of risk associated with diabetes. To our knowledge, this is one of the only studies to date that have shown the narrowing of the risk gradient. I think it gets back to some of the comments John has made where we're more equitably distributing the evidence-based therapies to patients with diabetes, and our data support that concept, that we're treating them as the high-risk patients that they are, and we're making progress. So what about glucose? So uh, I'll, I'll just go back to this. So despite decreasing the gradient of risk, there's still a gradient that exists. We've done fantastically with lipid management, with blood pressure management, effective antiplatelet therapies, um, risk intervention with lifestyles, but there's still the difference between the diabetic and non-diabetic patient is glucose. And so can we do better with glucose? Well, we know that patients having heart attacks have hyperglycemia commonly. If you have previously diagnosed diabetes and you come in with myocardial infarction, almost 80% of the time will your first on arrival blood glucose be elevated out of the normal range. That's no surprise to most people um, because these are insulin, insulin resistant patients in a stress situation. But more than one out of four patients who don't have diabetes will also have hyperglycemia on arrival. We heard the patient that Mike presented, um, diabetes diagnosed at the time of a myocardial infarction. This is not uncommon and we see it as do you. We also know, besides being common, it also pretends adverse mortality. In the yellow bar, this is one-year mortality across deciles of glucose on arrival. And whether you look at 30 days in increasing mortality or at one year in increasing mortality, it's very clear that hyperglycemia marks cardiovascular risk. And it begs the question, should it be a target of therapy? And that's the question that remains unproven. We've done some research in cardiology with glucose and insulin and acute coronary syndromes, but almost all of it has been with hyperinsulinemic, hyperglycemic protocols called glucose insulin potassium therapy. We have not to date tested type targeted blood, blood glucose control and acute coronary syndrome. So we're going to be left this afternoon dealing with some non-cardiovascular cohorts, and it's important for a primary care audience that most of the data we've abstracted comes from more common general populations. And so this will be useful whether or not you're taking care of acute coronary syndromes or not. So we need to dissect out in the literature those studies in the cardiology literature that use hyperglycemic, hyperinsulinemic infusions versus targeted glucose control. Well, as we've gotten interested in this, um, all of the professional societies have jumped on board in the, in the early 2000s. So in 2002, a joint position paper says strict glycemic control. The American Association of Clinical, Clinical Endocrinologists, normalization of blood glucose for acute coronary syndrome. American Diabetes Association, Association IV insulin infusion for acute coronary syndrome. ACCHA has, uh, since 2000, fairly uh, directed, uh, in a directed fashion, level 1B indications insulin infusion to normalize blood glucose. And so all these societies are giving us clinical pressure to treat the blood glucose, but there's no data behind these recommendations. These are expert opinions. 
The only study cited in the cardiology guidelines is this study, the Degami study. And it turns out that the Degami study was a hyperglycemic, hyperinsulinemic infusion. had nothing at all to do with tight glucose control, yet it stands as the only citation for the HA to give a level one indication for its targeted glucose control. This study, like all the GIK studies, used five units per hour of insulin supported by exogenous glucose administration. So this is hyperinsulinemic, hyperglycemic clamping effectively. And these patients had glucoses in the 170 range on protocol, and that was by design. So this was not normalization of blood, uh, blood glucose. There was a signal after a year of follow-up of improved outcomes. And so based on this single study, the enthusiasm began to mount in the cardiology literature. If you actually look at, t at resolved time over the first 24 hours and glucose excursions on the infusion, most of the time we're seeing data at 24 hours. And you see right around 170 is where this protocol will get you. But look at the first 24 hours. It gets you well up in near uh, 300 for some time before it gets down at 24 hours. So this is pretty, hyper, pretty, yeah. pretty marked hyperglycemia, not strict glucose control. So finally, we did a 20,000 plus patient trial. I had the fortune of being on the steering committee of this trial, the CREATE ECLA trial done around the world. 20,000 patients, over 3,000, almost 3,500 mortality events to analyze in this trial. Extreme statistical power. And we unequivocally proved that GIK infusion is not useful in contemporary management of acute coronary syndromes. And so this single trial put the nail in the coffin of this theory that had been in place for 40 years up until this trial. So we've abandoned glucose, insulin, potassium. I'll just skip this slide just to show you that all of these studies, the GAMI I showed you, CREATE, I showed you, they all use five units per hour of insulin. The only two trials that used more physiologic dosing were pretty small trials, both of them with a signal of increased mortality. One stopped early for mortality, the other with a non-statistical significant increase. So the only two times we've tested it in cardiology, we failed and with a suggestion of harm. So this is where the data comes from the more general population. If we haven't looked in cardiology, where have we looked? Well, we've looked in the surgical intensive care unit. And as most of you know, this single study published in 2001 completely changed clinical practice around the world in almost every ICU setting. The SICU study from the Vandenberg uh, trialist in Leuven, Belgium, um, showed that it was a 1,500 patient population. They reduced uh, major adverse clinical events, including all-cause mortality, by 40% with a measurable amount of hypoglycemia, but this was tolerable in the context of mortality reduction. And so 7% 7, 7 of patients had a glucose less than 40 with this targeted normalization of blood glucose. Well, since that one study that changed practice and made guidelines around the world and hospital administrators looking at quality performance metrics, um, whether or not you're treating blood glucose, we've had a series of negative trials not negative neutral, but negative killing people. And this is a serious important point to take home today is there is no evidence beyond this single surgical intensive care unit trial, no evidence to support targeted normalization of blood glucose. A 1,200 patient MICU trial, a 500 patient MICU trial, a 900 patient stroke trial, an 1,100 patient MICU trial, and another uh, MICU patient that we'll talk about in a little more detail. All of these randomized patients to get normalization of blood glucose with insulin versus usual care, all of them had major adverse clinical events as the primary outcome, and all of them were negative with either no change or increased mortality. Negative, increased mortality, statistically significant, 14% increased mortality. So this is the last study on that slide, the nice sugar. It's worth just spending a couple of minutes on here. 6,000 patients accumulated 1,500 mortality events, again, uh, marked statistical precision and with this number of events they convincingly proved an increase in mortality with intensive glucose control and importantly in a surgical ICU subset that was three times larger than the Vandenberg single center study this is a multi-center trial more generalizable to the population in practice even in the surgical intensive care unit subset, there was an increased mortality. But still no cardiovascular N subcomponent. No, exactly. No cardiovascular yeah. subcomponent. And I will, that's a great point that Kristen makes is Vandenberg study. This was largely cardiac surgery patients. 68% of these patients had undergone cardiac surgery. So these were cardiovascular patients. This was a more heterogeneous surgical intensive care unit population. There was very liberal in their inclusion criteria for this trial. They wanted, to be a, wanted it to be broadly generalizable across intensive care units but certainly no signal of, of benefit in any sub-analysis done in this trial.
We actually analyzed, we were the first, and this has been shown now four times, at least four times since, probably five times since in robust analyses, where a single episode of hypoglycemia during acute coronary syndrome portends adverse prognosis. We don't know if the hypoglycemia causes the problem or it's just a marker of underlying disease severity, but we published these data from a Gothenburg consecutive patient registry of a single episode of less than 55 in a hospitalized acute coronary syndrome patient had an increase, almost a two-fold increase to your two-year mortality after multivariable adjustment. So these are adjusted hazards associated with a single episode of hypoglycemia or persistent hyperglycemia, a 50% increase. And so if you had just a single value in the normal range, you did better than either of the other two um, comparatively. We don't know what that means, but there is a signal of caution for hypoglycemia in, in myocardial infarction patients. So this is where we are today. We've made a rapid retreat in the last three years, um, covering our tracks as we go. So in 2007, um, we've liberalized the target. Instead of normalization, it's 150 is the target. In 2008, said, no, we were just kidding about all that. It should be less than 180. In 2009, an update of the STEMI guidelines say we were just kidding about that 1A indication, that it really is a level B indication, and 180 is the target. And finally, we have two consistent recommendations. Less than 180 should be the target, and our friends at the American Diabetes Association across not just CCUs but all ICUs now endorse for critically ill non-surgical patients a target of 180. So we should be uh, being much more liberal with our application of insulin <coughs> for all patients, not just acute coronary syndrome. So we'll transition here to the chronic management. There's been a lot of interest and a lot of activity in the chronic management looking at cardiovascular risk and outcomes with a variety of glucose control strategies. Now, the endocrinologists were fast out of the chute. They were the specialty actually doing the very first multi-center randomized trial. We cardiologists were late bloomers. Um, but, unlike, but, but unfortunately, the endocrinologists did one trial and got burned by the trial and never did another for about 30 years. So these are the 1970s, the University Group Diabetes Program. This is a clinical outcomes trial, multi-center randomized, type 2 diabetes, randomized to five different therapies for treatment of blood glucose. You only see four here. That's because finformin was taken off the market because of lactic acidemia and was dropped from the trial. So finformin was actually early on in this trial. But these patients were randomized to tolbutamide and early sulfonylurea, insulin variable, which was titrated insulin to tight glycemic control targets, insulin standard, which was either 5 or 10 units a day, almost an insulin placebo for most of our patients these days, and then truly a pill placebo. We're, we're, so we were doing placebo-controlled diabetes trials back in these days. Well, this trial turns out it was stopped early because of this yellow line, the tolbutamide arm, with all-cause mortality and cardiovascular cause mortality increasing with the sulfonylurea tolbutamide. So increased mort mortality, and the, that arm of the trial was stopped, and the FDA made the manufacturer of the drug modify the product label. Now, you have to remember in 1970, the only thing we had to use was insulin, alpha-glucosidase inhibitor, and tolbutamide. And so if they removed it from the market, we would only have insulin and AGIs left over. And so instead of taking off the market in the paucity of other therapeutic options, they just put in the product label that this drug may be associated with increased cardiovascular mortality. And as funny as that sounds, this same product label warning is on every single sulfonylurea you've ever prescribed, including today. Every sulfonylurea today, glineparide, glycoside, gliburide, they all have the same warning that this drug may increase your cardiovascular mortality. Maybe or maybe it not should it be there, but it's there. So what do we know about cardiovascular outcomes? We know very little. Um, you'll hear me over and over again talk about how many events were counted. That's the statistical power and precision of the trial. And if you look at the entirety of diabetes research up until the last couple of years, there were fewer than 1,000 total events across these, whatever, six trials represented here in diabetes. Um, so very few events. We, we do single trials now with three and 5,000 events, and so... A thousand events across the entire field, we just don't have an idea what we're doing. But with those a thousand events, there's no signal of efficacy for cardiovascular outcomes. That UGDP study I showed you already, eight years on protocol, five years post-protocol follow-up, tight control with insulin versus placebo, spot-on identical numbers. A small study in Japan that had six versus four events showed proof of concept, apparently. They extrapolated their data to the population of Japan before they did their analyses. So this is a statistically significant reduction of 35%, but with six versus four events, it's, it's statistical heresy. Similarly, a small study in the U.S. and VA patients, a 
point estimate in the wrong direction, that a 40% increased risk with intensification of glucose control with a sulfonylurea-based regimen. UKPDS, I showed you those data already, a favorable signal finally for the cardiovascular community, a 16% risk reduction, p-value is 0.052, so the statistician's worst nightmare, that barely not significant value. 16%, and a lot is made of this, but not so much is made of the 11% increased stroke that happened with intensive glucose control. So if you look at our gold standard major adverse cardiovascular event, this is a neutral effect for tight glycemic control, even with contemporary insulin and sulfonylurea management. This study got a lot of play. Again, this is a type 1 diabetes patient population. The DCCT trial followed up epidemiologically for now 17 years total, so eight years on protocol, type control versus usual care of type 1 diabetes. 17 years of follow-up. This is 24 versus 12 events. And this is the proof of concept that the diabetologists use and published in the New England Journal of Medicine. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about 36 total cardiovascular events. Um, so we just really don't know what we're doing with cardiovascular disease. So that's the uncertainty. So we'll talk most of the rest of the time about where, where are we somewhat certain. And there's nowhere that we are very certain in diabetes with glucose control. But one of the most certain things is that metformin should be the first-line drug from the, from the UKPDS substudy. So if you got into this trial and you were obese at study entry or overweight, you were eligible to get metformin in addition to one of two sulfonylureas or insulin. And if you got metformin compared with usual care at the time, a 40% reduction in MI, statistically significant, and a 50% reduction in mortality. Now, I always teach my residents, if you see anything in medicine that reduces cardiovascular risk and mortality by 40 and 50%, don't believe it. It just doesn't exist in the world. Um, so these are inevitably overestimates of the treatment effects, small numbers of events to analyze, but it's a ray of hope in the right direction. It's a well-tolerated, safe, and now generic and cheap drug. And so for all those reasons, it's the first-line drug, and it's the only oral drug that is recommended to be continued when you start insulin therapy. Pioglitazone, we can talk, uh, I'm sure there'll be some questions about rosiglitazone and pioglitazone, actos and avandia. A um, lot of uh, activity just in the last 10 days. Um, but pioglitazone is the, is the only drug in the history of diabetes research that's had a cardiovascular outcomes study done. No other drug in the history of diabetes has had a cardiovascular outcomes trial other than the proactive trial, which was a test of pioglitazone or actos versus placebo. Now, this is pioglitazone added to background therapy versus placebo for patients with type 2 diabetes who at study entry had prevalent cardiovascular disease. So these are advanced disease type 2 diabetic patients. Over 600 major adverse cardiovascular events. This is, on this slide, is heart attack, death, and stroke. So unequivocal natural events occurring in the course of disease of atherosclerosis. And a 16% statistically significant reduction in atherosclerotic vascular events. As we know with rosiglitazone, the signal goes in the opposite direction, and I'll show you those data in a second um, summarized. So we have one study, the proactive study, again summarized here. Um, a, a, this is the primary outcome, so this is not statistically significant. This included leg revascularization and coronary revascularization, so non-spontaneous events. Um, a 10% point estimate towards reduction with point estimates almost excluding unity, so almost statistically significant 10% reduction. The widely interpreted negative ACCORD trial is actually not quite as negative as most people believe. It was a 10% relative risk reduction, just like proactive, and very narrow confidence limits, almost excluding unity. So just missing statistical superiority. The hindrance here is there was an excess of mortality that stopped the trial early, and we have to take that into account. The advanced trial, again, um, um, over 1,000 events accumulated in this trial of about 11,000 high-risk diabetic patients. Um, 6% point estimate towards improvement. So these are not going in the wrong direction. They're just not large and they're just not statistically significant. But at least we can deduce some safety of this if on the backdrop we have microvascular disease risk reduction. And I think that's the take home message. The VADT, the VA population again in the United States, a 12% point estimate, a relative risk reduction. And I show you all these data. I know it's overwhelming, but I want to make one point here. These upper confidence limits, 1.02, 1.04, 1.06, the FDA has drawn a line in the sand and said from this day forward, your drug has to exclude an upper confidence limit of 1.3, proving cardiovascular safety before you can be approved. And so if these were studies of drugs instead of studies of strategies, every single one would widely eclipse the present FDA regulatory benchmark for approval for a new drug. And so taking that into account, these are sufficiently safe statistically. They're just not home runs when it comes to cardiovascular risk.
Then more, um, more optimistically, we see the longer-term follow-up from the UK PDS. So this trial, again, newly diagnosed type 2 diabetic patients, randomized to glucose control strategies, 10 years on the protocol on average, and then followed for an additional 10 years. And during that additional 10 years of follow-up, statistically significant reductions emerged in cardiovascular outcomes. So that now we're talking about 15% reduced major adverse cardiovascular events and with metformin, 33% reduction. So it may be that tight control earlier in the course of disease, these are newly diagnosed, contrasted with type 2 diabetes for 8 to 10 years and atherosclerotic vascular disease. So aggressive early and less aggressive late may be the take-home message here. This is the meta-analysis, and I'll just show you two-point estimates. So if you look at all of these trials together and statistically analyze them, 15% statistically significant reduction in myocardial infarction and a point estimate of neutrality for mortality. So this one accord observation has not been seen in any other trial, and so targeted glucose control at present standards still appears to be both safe and slightly beneficial from a cardiovascular perspective with the faith and assumption that the microvascular disease risk will justify the therapy. And so we do have a lot of um, optimism. Not, uh, we've seen a lot of pessimism from these trials. They weren't the home runs we hoped they would be, um, but they're still um, fairly safe therapies. Um, so with that, both ADA, AHA, and ACC have continued to endorse an A1C target of less than 7. Not less than 6.5 and not less than 6, but less than 7 as a target of therapy for glucose control for patients with cardiovascular disease. These are the data I suggested earlier that have led to the recent um, brouhaha at the FDA and Congress and GlaxoSmithKline. So the rosiglitazone point estimates of efficacy for coronary heart disease, these are myocardial infarction point estimate risk from the ADOPT trial, from the DREAM trial, from the RECORD trial, from the major meta-analysis from Steve Nissen, and importantly from GlaxoSmithKline's own individual patient level data show a statistically significant increased risk of 30% for myocardial infarction. That is qualitatively different than what you see with pioglitazone. So although they are in the same class, these are two completely different drugs. Pioglitazone with the proactive study is not only safe but probably effective. Rosiglitazone is probably has a risk signal going with it. And so this point estimates about 20% reduction in myocardial infarction compared with about a 30% increased risk. And lots of reasons um, have been postulated, none have been proven as to why this discordance may occur. And so I'll just close with where are we today? So I've shown you a lot of uncertainty. We, we really haven't studied the area very well, and when we've studied it, it's given us disappointing and discordant results, and we're still uh, trying to deal with a lot of this, and we may be more confused than ever. But at least we have some benchmarks established that we can move forward from. So as I mentioned, in December of 2008, the FDA and in parallel the Europeans medicine, European Medicines Agency, which is the FDA equivalent for Europe, changed their paradigm for reviewing drugs for diabetes. And this is a series of pressures that converged um, to lead to this decision. First, diabetes is common. We can't simply ignore it. Like, it's not like lupus or rheumatoid arthritis that have large uh, mor morbidity but is relatively uncommon. We now have 10% of the U.S. adult population with this disease, we really need to know better what we're doing to patients, how they feel, and how they live. Um, we've increasingly appreciated the cardiovascular consequences of the disease. As I mentioned, in 95, we only had three therapeutic options. Metformin came on in 1995. In 2010, we have over 30 formulations in more than 12 classes. So we have this potpourri of drugs to choose from now, and we have the luxury of time to pause here and say, now we have all these options available. Let's take our time and figure out which ones are better and are the new ones better than the old ones, and that's kind of where we are. And finally, the discordance in clinical trials. Pioglitazone looks good. Rosiglitazone looks bad. What do we do about that? They both cause heart failure. What do we do about that? Um, there's discordant data with metformin. UKPDS looks good. The other trial called the ADOPT trial, which was similar in size and duration with UKPDS, doesn't look so good for metformin. So we have all these discordant signals that we need to try to resolve. And here's how we're going to resolve many of them, through randomized prospective clinical trials, cardiovascular outcomes trials. So this is a series of the trials I'm aware of um, that are ongoing, and two of these at the bottom now have also started, Excel and Saver. So we're looking at insulin glargine, citagliptin, acrobose, rosiglitazone, pioglitazone, alogliptin, canafligazin, if you can say that. That's a... That's a that attacks a receptor in the kidney that makes you spill glucose in the urine, creating a glucose sump in the urine. Um, Tasploglutide, this is an injectable GLP-1 analog. 
Allaglitazar is a dual PPAR alpha gamma agonist. Liraglitide, another GLP-1 analog, as is exenatide and then saxagliptin. So saxagliptin, citagliptin, and allagliptin are all these BPP-4 inhibitors. So they're tablets that augment the increased system. So this represents over 100,000 patients today presently being enrolled in outcomes trials that we'll know in five to seven years um, how better to treat the patients with these newer therapies. And so I'll just stop there and uh, maybe we'll have some questions. So terrific uh, talk, Darren. That, that uh, it gives us a nice overview of where Thanks. we're heading.